Welcome to everyone that's um, logged on tonight. Thank you for making the time to join us. My name is Piper Harrison and I'll be hosting this evening's session and I'm one of the candidates representing the Your Northern Beaches Independent Team for the Manly Ward. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Gurungai people, the traditional custodians of the land where I am tonight and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future who have been the caretakers of this beautiful country for thousands of years. And I would just like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples in attendance tonight. Um, so first I'd like to provide an outline of tonight's session together. This is the third and last of three town hall sessions for the Manly Ward candidates from your Northern Beaches independent team. And it's been great getting to know you and your issues. Um, I just need to let you know that we'll be recording tonight's session mostly so we can revisit all the great ideas that we discuss. We are hoping it's the beginning of a conversation, hopefully a fresh new way of doing things and a way of staying in touch with the community. So tonight we have three key aims. The first is to introduce you to the Manly Ward candidates for the Your Northern Beaches independent team. The second is to listen to Manly and Fairlight and understand your questions, concerns and desires for your area. And the third is to better understand what your expectations for council are in these areas and therefore how we could best represent you on council. Um, so before we get into the issues, let's meet the team who would like to represent you in the Manly Ward. We are fortunate to have with us from the Your Northern Beaches Independent team, the current mayor, Michael Regan, and a current Manly councillor, Sarah Grattan. So firstly, let's meet Michael, current mayor of the Northern Beaches Council, the first popularly elected mayor in Warringah in 2008, re-elected by the community in 2012 and by fellow councillors in 2017 and 2021 for the Northern Beaches. He is passionate about giving the community a strong independent voice and continually improving the overall standards of council. Most recently leading our community through the COVID-19 pandemic and actively planning a strong recovery for local businesses and our community. So Michael, if I were to give you 30 seconds for an elevator pitch to explain what the Northern Beaches Council has achieved under your leadership, what would that be? Only 30 seconds, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think it's what's been really impressive and, and I will try and keep it as best I can to 30 seconds times two or three, but um, look, in all sincerity, putting this organisation together, it was a, um, most people know the history, there was a forced marriage, if you like, at the three different councils. Um, only one was voluntarily putting their hand up to be amalgamated. Um, we're in a council, which I was leading at the time, and that was largely because we thought it was in the best interest of the community, more broadly speaking, that we do that, it's better efficiencies and, and the like, and it could be reinvested. Um, but yeah, putting that together, we, we inherited from the administrator, not particularly um, particularly good council, I think. And um, what they inherited wasn't what was necessarily shown in the books either, which Sarah could touch on later with the, uh, the account side of things and the finances and stuff. It wasn't necessarily council showing a true picture. So there's all these steps and difficulties. And I guess putting that all together and getting a new seat, recruiting a new CEO with the new councillors, new structure in place that was from the elected body, um, then COVID hits, uh, we're just starting to make some ground, um, COVID hits and it throws uh, everything into chaos, but it really brought the staff together. And um, it's a big deal to bring 2000 staff together of different skills and different things. So um, yeah, and, leading, and being able to lead that through, we took a $46 million hit to our budget uh, by supporting businesses, by supporting the community, uh, by continue, continuing to deliver services. Um, but yeah, it, it's been an interesting transition. So I'm just really proud of how we handled that. How proud of the way the staff handled that in particular. Uh, we're the only council to keep the beaches open through COVID. Um, you saw the eastern suburbs closed down. We created the library to you service, uh, which is fantastic. And it just showed that our council could be innovative and, and agile and all those buzzwords that all the other councils like to use. But we're a big organisation and we did it. Uh, and we're probably the most successful council of all the amalgamated councils and going. Uh, and probably one of the most successful councils full stop, amalgamated or otherwise, in the state, which I'm really proud of. And that's been a big team effort um, and despite all the challenges. So it's been really humbling to be part of that, Piper. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, that's really good to hear. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Sarah Grattan now, who is one of the current Manly Ward councillors and our number one candidate for the Manly Ward at this election. She's also the COO of UNICEF Australia and a mother of three teenage girls. Sarah was first elected to council in 2017. 
and she has taken a keen interest in the financial governance and risk management at Council and is a member of the Audit and Risk Committee. She is the chair of the Transport and Travel Strategic Reference Group and has led advocacy on the tunnel and bus route changes. Sarah has also led on a number of youth issues, including achieving the recent study bubble for HSC students. So Sarah, in 30 seconds, what are you most proud of achieving for the Northern Beaches since you have been a Manly councillor? Thanks, Piper. I don't think I've stuck to 30 seconds yet, have I, in the other two? <laughs> I don't know how I'll go this time. Um, I think sort of the most important thing for me is Council is a $5 billion organisation and it has revenues of $400 million a year and that is big business. And so what I really bring is my professional skills in finance, governance, strategy and risk um, to make sure that the numbers add up and that we have appropriate stewardship of ratepayers funds. And, you know, some of the other things I've done is sort of, you know, making sure there's business cases that the, the reporting that we get is adequate. Um, we've got KPIs for tracking performance and so forth. So, you know, a lot of people find that sort of pretty boring, but I find that pretty important when uh, we've got, uh, you know, rate pays funds at, at stake. I've done, so the second thing, I've done a lot of advocacy on behalf of the community. Um, the tunnel, the bus, the bus changes and the HSC bubble. So we've just had another HSC exam in the household today. So maths extension two. Uh, so that's good. We've got another one out of the way. But the kids have struggled so much this year, um, those HSC children. So I was really excited that I was able to galvanise the kids together, work with the mayor, work with our local members, get in front of the education minister um, and get that study bubble up. I was very proud of that. Um, the, I think the other really key thing is the size of the council now really supercharges its ability to gain grants and appropriately look after our infrastructure. And so the state of the assets of Manly on amalgamation were, was pretty poor. So there was a lot of sort of touch up sort of work done, um, but the underlying infrastructure has been, was in really poor condition when we did all of the asset management plans and did some really detailed valuation work. So we've got new footpaths, we've re rebuilt two tidal pools, 40 baskets and little Manly, Clontaff's on its way. We fixed a number of playgrounds, you know, the Queenscliff Lagoon's looking pretty good and the toilets, you know, my first motion at council was about the toilets as I, um, I know Liam loves that joke. and. Um, but, uh, I've, you know, they're, they're not all perfect now, but we are in a much better place than where we were. But I think mostly what I've really enjoyed is working with such great team of people who support each other, you know, and we can work with all sides of politics as we are independent. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it, it's been fun and happy to put my hand up and, and go again. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. The last four years sound incredibly busy, but really productive for the Manly residents. So thank you so much for all that you do. Um, as there are three councillors in the Manly Ward, we have two new candidates for you to meet tonight. Our number two candidate for the Manly Ward is Chris Jackson. He's actually coming straight from work tonight um, and he will give you some more details when he arrives. Um, but let me tell you a few things about him. He's a local bus driver, a former soldier and a musician. As a Manly resident for over 20 years, he is a keen swimmer and runner who wants more participation in sport for greater health and wellbeing. And Chris is a supporter of local business and wants to ensure the council continues to engage with them in their long-term recovery. Um, so when Chris arrives, we'll um, give him time to tell us a bit more about why he's running for council. Um, and to give you a little bit more information about me, I'm a university student doing a Bachelor of Communication, Journalism and a Bachelor of Laws. I went to school locally in Manlyvale at McKellar Girls High School and I'm an active volunteer lifesaver and a current Ironwoman competitor. I also have a passion for social, social justice, especially in regards to Indigenous affairs. And I'm keen to see the youth have a stronger voice within council. Um, so some of the reasons I'm running for council, as I mentioned, one of the main reasons is that I want to be a voice of support for the youth. I am a first time voter myself this year, and I know that young people sometimes feel like their needs aren't heard. So I want to be that strong voice of support within council. I'm also passionate about establishing affordable housing so that I can move out of home eventually and leave my poor parents alone. Um, now that you've met the Your Northern Beaches team from the Manly Ward, um, some of you came to our online launch about a month ago, so you already know 
um, all about us. But if you have questions for us, you're welcome to ask. So now we can, now that you know who we are, we can move on to the important part of the evening. Um, this is where we want to hear from you guys. So this is your opportunity to ask questions, raise concerns, or share positive things that are going on in the community. It is important for us to know about the positive things too. Um, we have a few questions that were sent in and you will get your chance to speak live or please type your questions in the chat. We will also be running a few polls so you can write in the, um, your answers in the chat and we'd really appreciate your thought on what makes Manly and Fairlight special for you, your top two issues for Manly and Fairlight and what do the young adults of Manly slash Fairlight want. So please remember that the idea here is that we listen and collect your information about your suburb. We won't necessarily have the answers, but we might be able to start or continue to raise awareness about these issues. So if you could type your questions in the chat um, and we hopefully get to hear more about some of them tonight. Um, to start the discussion, we have four goals for Manly Ward that we are passionate about. Whilst all these goals are relevant to Manly and Fairlight, we would like your feedback on some of them and how they resonate with you. So the first one is to create a thrilling civic precinct for Central Manly centered on a community hub with an expanded modern library together with the town hall for creative or performing arts. Um, so to get started, Sarah, would you like to comment on that? Thanks, thanks Piper, and thanks for that great introduction. So what we know about sort of the center of Manly at the moment is it's all been looked at in a bit of a piecemeal uh, on a piecemeal way. We've got the town hall building, we've got the council offices, there's the Whistler Street car park and the, and the library. And it's all a bit of a mishmash. And really what we need to do to help support the economy of Manly and the residents of Manly is to, what I really wanna do is create this civic precinct which can support the, the economy of Manly all day rather than just before the ferry goes in the morning and takes everyone to the city and when after they come home. Um, at the moment, sort of, we don't really have a real community centre for the middle of Manly, and I think that library space can be expanded and really become that really thriving community hub with community space available. Um, we don't need to have our uh, sort of senior centre out near Curl Park. What I'd really like to do is bring that all into the middle. Um, and how are we going to do that? Well, at the moment, we're going through the Manly place planning process. And I mean, I know, I know there's, there's people on here tonight that are part of that community committee and we're talking about some of these ideas. I don't know if that's what's gonna end up, but we have been talking about how we can plan that area strategically so that we, we might well want the uh, performing or creative arts within the old town hall, but then what can we do for that, for that manly, that, that uh, library hub and so forth. Um, and it's not just about Manly either. So if we come up the hill a little bit and come up to Fairlight, I think that, you know, I've spoken with a number of the members of the community up there and that, that little shopping centre is really split by Sydney Road. And I think there are probably some quite simple things that we can do, particularly on that little slip road on the side to help create a more of a, a hub for the local um, locals of Fairlight where they can sort of sit, have a bit more footpath area there, can enjoy the, the cafes and, uh, and create a bit more of a town centre for them. So that's two sort of quick ideas there, but I'm interested to hear from what, what our community thinks and if they've got some ideas either in the chat or, um, or just pop, pop your hand up and Piper can facilitate that. Yeah, guys, feel free to raise your hand um, or type any questions into the Q&A function. Um, you're on screen so we can um, see you and if you raise your hand, we'll definitely um, call on you. We'll, we'd love to hear what you've got to say. Um, did anyone have anything to add to what Sarah was talking about? Oh, I think um, without being preemptive or presumptuous, um, Brian Dumpy has um, asked a lot of the candidates, myself included, previously about a surfing museum. And I think when Sarah um, describes the civic precinct that she envisages, sort of expanded on um, our, our good mate Candy Bingham and her exciting ideas for town hall and reuse of town hall, should that become available um, in the future? Um, as surplus stocks, which ultimately it probably will. And I think Sarah's idea is basically to expand that out um, to the like a whole of precinct and take some of the good parts that we saw of, um, I must say the good parts of the Manly Oval car park stuff where they had the uh, a, a nice new building in that sort of square um, where the library is. So 
if you can link all that sort of stuff up and we can converge a whole bunch of additional ideas in it, I think that's actually a really good opportunity to do um, significant um, positive things in it, include things like a surfing museum and surf life saving as well. So Brian, did you, I saw your hand go up then I think. Sorry, you're just on mute, Brian. Is that working? Yes. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, yes, look, uh, I'm rather disappointed to hear that you've put the um, proposals for the future of the town hall on the back burner. I was hoping for a, uh, a more immediate resolution of that matter. Um, you know, I've, I've got to congratulate the Northern Beaches Council for what they've done since um, amalgamation in terms of bringing, finding out what needs to be reviewed and bringing together a whole lot of plans. And, you know, I'll be rude to you, Michael, now and say, my God, you've got a lot of plans. Have a huge number of plans, but I want to see them put into action. And uh, unfortunately, putting the town hall plan on the back burner, or even the formation of the plan on the back burner, is very disappointing. My proposal with the surf museum, um, Michael, does work. It is very viable. Um, a centerpiece of the museum, I can. Uh, advise you is the use of virtual reality, uh, which will generate such a, an income as to not call upon council to put their hands in their pocket. I'm quite confident of that. And when we resume having tourists from overseas, a surf museum, if we're the first one in Sydney, and I'll tell you now, there are two or three others that are looking to establish surf museums in Sydney, but the first one will be the one that will attract tourists. And if we can do it well, and if all I need is your support, Michael and Sarah, um, I'll be able to go forward with the financing of this proposal. Um, I've spoken to the politicians, the local ones are very, keen on the idea. They can see the benefit for Manly, for the Northern Beaches. I mean, Manly is ultimately the home of surfing in Australia. Forget about the Duke being the first one to ride a surfboard. He wasn't, but the, we have records of surfboard riding in Manly two years before the Duke. So the Duke made it popular. He did. I don't deny that. But so, so, Brian, what, what I'll just say is that you weren't rude at all. So if you were trying to be rude, you failed. And um, what I'm I was, not trying to be rude. No, no. But what I was just going to say, mate, is I hope it, what I didn't want to give you the um, what I want to say is that it's not on the back burner. And you're right, we've got lots of plans, but we are actually enabling a lot of the plans, like the Manly Place plan, the destination plan's just been enabled, and we're doing a whole series of things um, with that at the moment. We're sitting supporting the state government on a lot of things. We did take a $46 million hit to the budget, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a lot of projects that have been pushed out a couple of years so that we don't have to um, borrow money like federal and state government have done. But separate to all that, um, the property strategy was supposed to have um, come forward to us in this elected council, but COVID killed that by a good two years. So it'll come to the new council very early next year. So that will determine the future of Manly Town Hall but it will also make us look very firmly at the library site and the precinct around that. And I think that's really important. So, because we don't have a lot, um, and, and by the way, the state government still owes us $5 million for the uh, Manly Surf Club and half a million dollars for the fit out of Kangaroo Street and um, or the Raglan Street building. So that's just, uh, the politicians are very supportive um, and now it's about putting the money um, where their mouth is, I think. And that's uh, how we can help you get there. And, and the surf life saving stuff's a good example too of where we're, taking our plans and making them into action with the um, state championships we've just announced. Well, so, yeah. with, all, with all due respect, um, Michael, you're, you're a, a newcomer to the beaches and 
surfers of my vintage will not look upon surf life saving and surfing as yep. we we are separate entities and i think today you saw luke from surfing new south wales uh with the politicians describing about the um the shark. resuscitation shark. and the shark uh, benefits that they're putting together surfing is an entity on its own and under luke's management of surfing new south wales it's going to go ahead in leaps and bounds in the next few years you, you as a council can get on board with the economic benefits of supporting something like a surf museum for which people will come to sydney and then come to manly to see our surf museum and you're right about surfing, it is a separate entity and we and we did a great WSL event up at North Narrabeen. We're doing the Challenger Series in March and uh, we'll have some other announcements, no doubt, very soon as well. So, but yeah, spot on. Yeah. Um, thanks, Brian. And we'll um, take notes from that too. It's great to hear people's different ideas and what people are wanting out of that um, town centre as well. Um, I can see Chris has arrived now, straight off the bus. Welcome, Chris. Um, would you like to say a few words and let us know a bit more about why you're running for council? Oh, just on mute, Chris. <laughs> Hello, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Thanks, Piper. Uh, apologies, everyone. Sorry for being late. Uh, I'll do this as quickly and as smoothly as I can. Um, uh, why do I love the Northern Beaches? I've worked and lived in every city in Australia except Darwin and Hobart, and there's nowhere like the Northern Beaches, for me at least. And why am I running council, running for council? The short answer would be to give back to the community. But if I can just take a minute to tell you a quick story. I did a split shift today at work. And during the break, uh, I decided to go letterboxing, uh, getting rid of the last few flyers into the letterboxes around Balgala. Walked about 5Ks and had some really good conversations with some uh, local business owners and some local residents. Two of the residents had issues that they wanted council to uh, look at for them. Uh, I took their names and details, uh, emailed them to Councillor Sarah Grattan, who I know gets this stuff done really quickly. Um, and I told them that I would be in, back in touch with them next week to see how it was going. No pressure, Sarah. Uh, but there, right in, this, right in a nutshell, it, it, the light bulb went off, went off in my head. That's why I want to run for council. I want to meet people. I want to find out what's good, find out what's bad, give them more good, and give them less bad. Thanks, Piper. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, I can see we've got a question from Roland. Um, he's asking what our, the, our position is on vaccine mandates and vaccine passports. Um, Michael, did you have anything to add on that? I spoke to Sarah. She's in charge of a huge organisation called UNICEF Australia, and you deal with this with your employees all the time. Well, I was actually going to say it's it's actually not up to Council Roland. So, you know, it's New South Wales Health makes the rules and we just have to follow the rules and implement those along those guidelines. So as far as I understand it, um, you know, uh, we, we're not doing a, a mandate for the for Council staff. I don't I don't believe they're having consultation at the moment, um, but the um, everything will open up eventually because of the amazing coverage we have with vaccine coverage at sort of it's fast approaching sort of 95 percent I think first dose and it's over 90 percent with two doses so you're speaking to somebody who works for UNICEF Australia who is we are part of the COVAX initiative that's vaccinating the world um, so I'm very pro-vaccination and I've had both my vaccinations and very proud to to make sure we keep our community safe as a public health measure um, so I don't think we're going to agree on that, Roland, but thanks for the question. Awesome. Um, we might move on to the second goal for Manly now, um, which is to protect our harbour, coastal and bush environment from inappropriate development via a new LEP and build resilience to the impacts of climate change. Um, Sarah, I know you um, are very interested in environmental issues. So did you want to get us started on this one? 
Yeah, well, I think what's really interesting about this is that we've got the new local environment plan that's going to have to come up to council. And, you know, a lot of the preparatory work has been done with the, the housing study and the employment study, um, uh, the you know environmental study, you know, across the beaches as they try to work out what is going to be that appropriate development. And we know we've got a lot of constraints, a lot of uh, areas affected by flood or by bushfires and we understand you know how that may well increase as the climate warms um, so I think this is a really important project for the community to get involved with so that we really understand what sort of development and where can be sustained and I think importantly um, we really don't need many more houses to meet that you know many, many more dwellings to meet the housing target that's been set we can do most of it within existing planning rules and and guidelines which is great um, the other thing on climate change has been a key topic with COP26. So, I, you know, I support the ambition of net, net zero by 2030 and point out that uh, with Council has um, signed a renewable energy contract last year with 100% renewable energy. So our emissions have come down by 80% already, so which is terrific. And I think the other side on the environment is really trying to get people out of their cars and into active modes of transport. And one of the key strategies I was involved with was the MOVE strategy, the transport strategy, um, which has a goal of getting 30% of people, reducing cars by 30% off the roads. And so, yeah, so we've been working really hard on sort of put, filling in the links of the bike, the bike lanes, um, more, more um, uh, footpaths in key areas between shops and schools and key traffic areas to, to try to support that. Yeah, awesome. Um, did anyone else have anything to add on this topic? Oh, I see Brian, you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, Piper. Sarah, given your support for getting more cars off the road, what is your position and that of the um, your Northern Beaches independent team? What is your position with regards to the tunnel that is proposed that will come out in the <clears throat> in the Manly Vale Balgala area, and all the very genuine opposition that is against this tunnel, given the environmental concerns that are going to be generated by the establishment of that tunnel. I, my own personal view is that we should not be uh, developing the tunnel; that we should be developing transport, public transport, in order to get the cars off the road? How does the your Northern Beaches independent team stand in regards to that? So thanks for that question, Brian. I always love to talk about the tunnel, don't I, Mayor? Um, the, um, the, the tunnel, uh, firstly, we're all independents. So yes, we, we group together for the purposes of a... Of a um, an election, but we, you know, we can have our own views. I've been leading on the tunnel for the council because I, I live up in Balgala and a lot of the local community here are very concerned about it. Uh, I can't do anything about tunnel, no tunnel. So it's a state government project. But what I can do is make sure if we're going to get a tunnel, it's going to be a good one. So my advocacy has been very much about trying to minimise any negative impacts. So, you know, the environment, the, the damage to the environment is really concerning. The loss of the water table and the groundwater um, is a big problem that we've, we've identified. The, the potential for water to cross catchments and be contaminated and come into our catchment is a big problem. We've been talking about the air filtration similarly a big problem. The number of trees are going to be lost. I think it's 3,500 trees. Um, you know, really big concerns. And so working very hard with the council staff and the environment team has been amazing, getting all that information back to Transport for New South Wales and saying, how are you going to fix this and how are you going to fix that? If I came out and said no tunnel, then the state government won't listen. Hands over the ears, la, 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 la. I lose any impact. But by actually working constructively with them has been my, my approach and how I've, I've managed this we've actually been able to get some quite big concessions out of them. Uh, what, in terms of transport, we have got a commitment that public transport will run through that tunnel. Um, the issue with, you know, people ask me, well, why don't we have a rail line? What, you know, got to, to come through to the beaches? 
So when I spoke to the head of strategy at Transport for New South Wales about that, and I said, look, Wollongong has got a similar population to the Northern Beaches. They've got a train line. Why can't we have a train line? And he said to me, well, Wollongong gets a train once an hour. You know, if we are trying to move people into, into the city, um, we're not going to be able to have trains once an hour. So what that means is we don't have the population density and it's spread out across the beach, you know, a long, long, you know, 20, what's it, 25 kilometres or so 32. up the beaches. 32, there, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, we won't be able to um, su support that sort of frequency without masses of development. And the community doesn't want masses of development. You know, we, we have all of these constraints, as I mentioned earlier, the environmental, the flood, the bushfire, we cannot support, our, our, our environment cannot support a massive development like what's happened out in the inner west, you know, in the west, up at Castle Hill, for example, Castle Towers, we just can't do that and the community won't accept that. But what we can do with that, with a tunnel space, should that tunnel be built, is rapid bus type on on road type transport there's the electric trams that we've been talking about um, which are on road that that Michael has, has knows more about that than me that we can make sure that there is that transport through the tunnel so we haven't got a commitment that will be dedicated public transport lane um, but they have you know they're making the tunnel big enough to fit a beeline bus uh, so that we can run that that sort of transport line through there which does seem the most efficient for the type of area that we've got and the type of geography and demographics. You know, I, you know, we, I've talked to a number of people about different options is ideas of having a train line, you know, coming through from uh, under the heads from Bondi Junction and going up to, to Gosford. But again, to sustain anything like that, they're going to be expecting, you know, mini Chatswoods all the way along the beaches. Oh, yeah. And I just don't think that that will be supported by our community. As a bus driver. As a bus driver, a tunnel would be great, uh, honestly. And on Saturday, I know people say uh, get people off the off the cars into the buses. But what happens on Saturday? Saturday, the the traffic is going everywhere. People can't take buses because they're not going to where they want to go. Uh, a tunnel, a tunnel is a, is the simplest solution, I think. And although you know environmentally there's a lot of concerns, it's the simplest solution. And also, if you if you're going to south of the city, if you're going to Canberra or Melbourne or the Snowy Mountains, you get into the tunnel of Balgala and the next set of traffic lights you see are in Canberra. It's freeway the whole way. So that's my two cents worth. And you're spot on, Chris. That's, that's exactly right. The people who are trying to leave the Northern Beaches. Within the Northern Beaches, it's an absolute gridlock. Saturday yep. morning for Awful. sport, transfer between the, the various locations, yep. it's yep. an absolute headache. However, this tunnel is to take us from the northern beaches to the city or to beyond the northern beaches. And why not stand for a public transport tunnel rather than a general public tunnel? I mean, you're right. The uh, B line, uh, the transit lane, they've made huge differences to the travel time yep. between the city and uh, between the beaches and the city. Now we've got to make people realize to, that they, to get into the city Monday to Friday, they have to get out of their cars, they have to get onto public transport. And a way to do that would be to make it a public transport only tunnel, the environmental impact would be minimal as against what is proposed at present. And further to that, um, I think it's the inner city council, whatever name it goes by, they raise objections to nuclear powered submarines. So Sarah, why can't you raise objections to the tunnel and still get away with it? Oh, well, I think I, Sarah, I, I, sorry, sorry to jump in, Sarah, but you, she did raise, we all raised objections to the tunnel and it was in our submission and, and we got lots of concessions as a result and that's what Sarah was pointing out. And so, uh, and we're all, well, the more pleasing thing is, is that the tunnel is not just one tunnel into the city, it also goes to St Leonard's and it also goes to Chatswood. So there's those three additional ports opened up immediately 
And one of the one of the important things too is the trackless trams that are electric. They're in operation, becoming more and more common. Um, and, and we're going to see that. So I think the bus fleet will all be electrified by 2030, I think. Um, and it's designed to be able to, to become a public transport tunnel and take a bit of the private car usage as well. So I think that's been six lanes, I think it is for memory, Sarah, in total, like in its widest parts. That's why it's being able to take those, you know, 24 hour better, dedicated public transport, at the very least a T3, et cetera. So that's all being planned for the future as capacity is required and connections are made. So they're the wins that we've had by being able to, and you know, the government has announced a policy in the state at least, that they want electric cars by 2030. So you'll start to see the rapid uptake now, like Europe's doing it by 2025. Um, people keep saying, oh, no, that's not gonna happen. The transition won't happen. I'm telling you now, it's happening already. And we're seeing it all across the state and the country. And so, and then there'll be hydrogen electric, which is even better. And that ta that'll take up the light, uh, the heavy fleet um, and have the discussions of, during the week. So I'm, I'm quite positive about the potential of it and um, and the fact that we do. We've already got the infrastructure to turn up and go bus at DY to Chatswood, nine stops every 10 minutes. Brilliant. And that, that will be much better used for the tunnel. So, And we've got Infrastructure Australia now buying in. So they're going to fix the uh, outside office works there in DY. They've prioritised that project to be within the next five years to separate that. So breaks up that traffic log seven days a week through that um, DY and, and Brookvale and also widen parts of Brookvale um, where it goes from three lanes to two. They've also committed to doing that work as well. So basically from Seaforth to Mona Vale just with that big one at DY there is planned by Infrastructure Australia in the next five years to free up the existing mess. So the tunnel hopefully will be a bonus, but you're right, it should be more about public transport, full stop, and they're the wins that we've had. Thank you, Sarah, for your advocacy, because there's one or two on our team who don't support the tunnel, Brian, and they voted against it. Sarah, did you have anything else to add on that, or are you happy for us to move no, on? No, I think, I think there was a question um, about youth. Did you see that one? Yeah. Um, so Ruby from um, Fairlight has asked, what plans do the Your Northern Beaches Independent team have for the youth of the area? Um, so I'll just um, comment quickly on that first. Um, I think as um, someone that's quite young, one thing that I would be really keen to push for and see happen is to create more um, events for the youth to attend within the Northern Beaches and more places for them um, to hang out together. I know, um, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a lot of young people felt quite isolated. Same with everyone. Um, no doubt, but I think it was um, quite tough mentally um, to get through the pandemic and it would be great to see um, more events. I know there's been concerts at the past at the Hardboard Diggers. Um, um, yeah, so just places for the youth to get together and establish that sense of community, I think is really important. So that's something that I would be really keen to push for. Um, did anyone else? have something to add? I was just going to say thanks Pam this is why it's so great to have you on the team because one of the hardest things is actually reaching youth and to find out you know what exactly they want and sort of you know the the mums and dads and the old fatty daddies that are on the council you know we have our well-intentioned ideas but um, they don't always go down uh, as well you know I've had a couple of people ask me recently oh bring back the dancers like we used to have at the kangaroo <laughs> club and um, and the staff who manage to sort of the youth services are saying mm, no, that's not the sort of dance that they were thinking of. So <laughs> um, so you know really clean to listen. We've got the youth um, KLOF, the the youth mm -hmm. sort of uh, advisory group, and that's great. And they feed up some great information. Um, and I think events and, and activities like that are, are really important. And Michael, I don't know if you want to say anything. I mean, the PCYC is a fabulous asset we can use to help do this sort of thing. And I was just going to add something a little bit funny today. I had somebody saying to me, um, they're opposing my stance on the office at East Esplanade and having a crack at me. And then I had another person write to me and say, can we put on a, a big year 12 party at the office? Because <laughs> we've had such a tough two years. And I just went, oh, I love my job. <laughs> so what is your position on the office, Michael? Because, you know, I started yep. talking about the youth. And I've been down and observed the office and it does seem to be primarily young people, somewhat 
a little bit older than Piper by the looks of it. But, you know, we have all these fabulous areas around the northern beaches and, you know, freshwater got hit about a fortnight ago with a big party on the slope above next to Pillu. Mm. Are we going to shut down these public areas for the sake of, oh, we don't want the rubbish and the noise, or are we going to say to the state government, this is your responsibility to manage these areas as by having sufficient police here to enforce the rules. Uh, it's for council to have the uh, rangers there after hours. I mean, I think rangers clock off at seven o'clock or something like that. I might be wrong there, but, you know, is it is it not a case of we have these wonderful community areas and we should be utilising them rather than putting fences around them and saying, no, no, you, you're irresponsible, we can't trust you to... Yep, 100%. So my stance has been, and I'll quickly fight up um, again, and, you know, and the residents, some of the behaviour you just can't condone. It is, well, some of the stuff that we saw was 100% um, inappropriate, wrong, disgusting, disgraceful, every other adjective you can, you can use, right? So we all agree on that. But what was really, but we had a, it was like almost like the perfect storm. There's a government asking us to go out and picnic and get on it and rah, 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 and actually legislated that in different parks that they own from Penrith to Parramatta to Centennial Park. So in our own backyard, we've had um, that perfect storm. The Friday night, for example, before the last, the big hoo-ha um, that we had at the office, but the Friday night was quiet. There was nothing really happening. There was a few hundred people around. Um, but the Saturday night was the exact opposite. There was 3,000 people there. The police and the rangers were on the, had the same role, patrols and the rosters. And so for the last two years, uh, so we were in council for four years, but the two years before COVID, it was relatively well controlled and relatively well, um, it, it was fine, if you like. There might have been one or two instances where it was not great, um, but it was dealt with and, um, and there's little adjustments made. The two years of COVID was completely different with everything shut down, nowhere to go afterwards, beforehand, et cetera. And we had a couple of perfect storms, Porsches and those super spreading events. The reality is, you're right, that was fresh water, something happened. Uh, Collaroy was another one, Avalon, Bellrose. It was happening all up and down and out in the peninsula. So the police saw it, we saw it, we know it was happening. And you can't put fences around it. You just give some bit of faith in the youth in particular. And um, they by and large do the right thing 99% of the time just as we did when we were younger and just as we do now as adults, we sometimes get a little bit out of control. But yeah, I'm, my stance is we need to make sure we continue to do what we're doing and it works fine. 99% of the time it works at the office. And I think the 1%, unfortunately, where it got extreme and got reported on quite rightly because it was disgraceful. Yeah. I, I'd I... jump in there. I'd jump in there, sorry, and just say a big shout out to the council workers. I train down at South Stain most mornings, 5.30 and that morning, after that Saturday night, all the rubbish had been bagged up. It was sitting there waiting to be collected. It was fine. It was fine. Yeah. And I was just going to um, add, I could see both sides to this issue. Like I used to go down for afternoon picnics with my family there and you can't really do, you couldn't really do that for a while on a Saturday night because it was um, pretty packed with young people. But I also um, see the other side. I have been down there with my friends a few times and it is, like a really fun thing to do. And that's sort of what I'm talking about. Young people like to have somewhere where they can gather together and um, yeah, spend time together. I think it particularly got bad during uh, COVID because obviously we couldn't go to the local um, pubs and bars. So that became the gathering point. So hopefully it's a bit better now, but it is spaces like that, that um, make the Northern Beaches such a great place to live um, where we can all yeah, gather together and have such a beautiful view while <laughs> catching up with friends. So it is a tricky issue. But and that and the fencing was just really a circuit break. I mean, the we did need to returf it, so it was probably brought forward a little bit early, um, just just to do that, just to be able to put a bit of a, a pause on it whilst the pubs and clubs and everything were opening again. Um, and uh, it's planned to be opened again soon. I'm not sure the exact date. It was only going to be closed for a few weeks, but um, 
hopefully it will, it will be calm enough when it reopens that it can be managed and stay open. Um, yeah. yeah. Liam, I see you have your hand up. Did you have something to add? I'm sorry. You're not on mute, but we still can't hear you. Sound issues. <laughs> You've still got sound issues. Feel free um, to type something in the Q&A function. We can maybe... We'll do um, what the rest of us do. Log in and log out. <laughs> that's beyond me. <laughs> um, um, yeah, there's um, been a question from Steve um, who has said, Chris, I see on your candidate info sheet that you're a musician. Um, would you like to see more live music venues in Manly and how would you get the balance right between tourism, visitors and residents? Yeah, good question. And uh, it kind of goes to uh, what Piper was talking about, trying to get a mix uh, for the youth and for the adults. Uh, it'd be good to have a, a mix of uh, venues, but I'm not sure how that works business-wise because everyone wants to sell alcohol. Um, of course, live music has always struggled in Sydney. I was a professional musician for 25 years and I've seen it go up and down. Theatres closed, new theatres open, venues closed. There's uh, not a lot of live venues left in Sydney. Uh, there used to be a huge club scene, of course, people from my age group back in the 70s and 80s, people, musicians can make their living playing five nights a week in a club. You just can't do that anymore. So it's got to be a mixture of venues. Uh, talking about uh, dances for kids, I mean, we can have dance clubs for kids that are you know, obviously a pop-up, not a, a, a long-term uh, business. Uh, but maybe like the old blue light disco, people might remember that, but more uh, for more modern dance music. Yeah. Definitely. Um, does anyone else have any ideas on that? I'll just remind everyone, um, feel free to raise your hand and have a chat with us or type any questions you have in the Q&A function because we're happy to hear all your views and thoughts. Um, if that's it for now, um, we'll move on to the third goal for the Manly Fairlight area. We've sort of touched on it already, but um, it's about advocating to reduce local traffic congestion, parking stresses, and the adverse impacts of the Beaches Link Tunnel and environments. So obviously we've touched on the tunnel already, but I think um, traffic congestion um, and parking stresses in Manly and Fairlight is definitely something um, we want to improve. So. Um, Chris, did you have anything to get us started on that? Oh, I'll just unmute myself. Uh, parking. God, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I rented in uh, Victoria Parade for 10 years. And on a Saturday or a Sunday, you drive around the block for 20 minutes looking for somewhere to park. Um, it's so tough. I was looking at a map of Manly the other day, just thinking about traffic. And it's uh, the narrow neck of land uh, where Manly is. It just makes it so difficult. Uh, so there's only those three roads that travel um, sort of roughly in the same direction as Sydney Road towards the head, towards North Head. And um, I, I just don't know what the solution is as far as getting traffic in and out of, uh, out of the area and parking. Uh, I know council has um, uh, experimented with shorter parking limits and longer parking limits. And I think for, for the businesses, they like the shorter ones so that uh, the cars rotate more. But that's a really tricky one. That's not something I um, have a solution for now. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, Sarah, did you want to add anything? Because I was going to throw in the. You jump. Technology. You jump in, Michael. I, I'll. Um, and by the way, Liam, um, there's a someone said here. Uh, Liam might try go to the bottom left of the screen, click on the arrow next to audio settings, and select same as system. That usually works for her, but we still can't hear you. <laughs> All good. Um, so very quickly, um, no, that's a good question about traffic and parking. Uh, one of the things council's doing is we've signed up with the New South Wales State Government to use the live parking app. We'll roll out through the, uh, the beaches, the different um, technology you see in car parks with the sensors and things so that we can um, have live traffic data. So you, you don't bother driving to Shelley Beach if you know that there's no parking there. So you, you go elsewhere. So that, that's being rolled out as we speak. So that's a, it's a positive and we'll start to see other initiatives like that. But um, I'm trying to get a trial for DY, um, the length of B light. So we do, do the, the bus that just what you call it, like a turn up and go bus. One of those just, um, every, just keeps going or doing a loop down to DY beach and, uh, and back and just keep doing that. So 
Uh, that will hopefully be successful. Um, we're, we're working with Kilios Downer, who just took the contract um, to do something like that, to do a trial. They're doing one up at um, Newcastle. I think it's driverless as well, which is awesome. Um, so we've got to think outside the square a bit and, and get more people. And we're doing the off-road bike and cycling and active transport stuff, which is really important too. But traffic and parking, yeah, it's a nightmare. And um, whilst ever we have kids living at home, that's going to be two, three additional cars depending on how many kids you got on top of. So it, it's just a, it's a first world problem uh, and it's not an easy one to solve when you've got such a densely populated area historically. And I think just, just to add to that, so as part of the Manly Place Plan discussions, sort of cycling and, and active transport has been part of that. You know, where can we make sure we have adequate parking for, for, um, for bikes that are secure and safe for people to encourage them to, to use that for the shorter trips? Um, and things like that as well, in addition to the sort of the smart parking stuff that we've, we've been looking at. So, yeah, but no easy solution, no easy solution. And, and the parking uh, systems that we've got in place, the, the, the permit schemes, the um, resident permit schemes, aren't compliant with what the um, state government <laughs> requires. So you're only supposed to have a parking scheme with as many spaces as their... Um, as many permits as there are spaces and uh, we've got something like we've reduced it but i still still think it's three times as many permits as yeah. there are spaces so some yeah. still works to go there brian i love this you're on mute <laughs> <laughs> not going to give up that saying um i went down to cronulla yesterday and the northern beaches manly in particular is absolutely fantastic compared to Cronulla. I had to park a mile away from where I wanted to go yesterday. The parking down there is unbelievably bad. But having said that, my concern as a resident of the northern side of Fairlight Balgala is Balgala Road. Uh, we have three bottlenecks on Balgala Road. The first one on the eastern side is Pitwater Road and Bargala Road at uh, the, the Manly Senior Citizen Centre. The next one is Kenneth Road and Bargala Road at the swimming pool. And the third one, and most likely the worst, is uh, Rosebury Street and Bargala Road. The, the traffic in each of those three locations at any time of the day can be absolutely unbelievable. I have to come down Rosebury Street, sorry, not uh, Rosebury Street. I come down at the western side of uh, the swimming pool and the traffic extends past Grange Reserve. If I go the other way up to uh, towards Manly Vale, the traffic turning into Rosebury Street goes back to the golf club, the perimeter of the golf club. Agree. And on so a Saturday, Brian, and how bad is it on a Saturday? It's like the, even worse on a Saturday than any other day. It's unbelievable. Shocking. It's a shocker. Um, so, so what are we going to do? Yeah, so they've, they've been looking at it. Some of the and, and investigating some potential solutions, uh, they're going to cost a lot of money. Um, a lot of the the problems become a lot worse since the Beeline bus stop went in there, and we've also had Aldi and those other shops on on Roseby Street at that end. Um, it's always been a bit of a problem down near the pool end, but it is getting worse and worse. So anyway, so they're looking at it. They're, they're, um, they're actually part of the tunnel discussions is about how we access some capital to try to resolve some of those areas. Um, you know, is, is there a possibility of a one-way loop system there to try to move that traffic on? I think they're looking at an inter, uh, a lights, traffic light intersection um, instead of the roundabout. Um, I think that's being investigated by the traffic committee. Um, so yeah, we hear you. It's a nightmare, something has to be done. We, I just don't quite have, know what the solution is yet. So if you've got any ideas and what the solution might be, you know, some of these most complex problems are best solved by ideas from the community. I found that out over the years. Um, so, yeah, I think Annabelle's got a point. Have you, Yeah, Annabelle, Annabelle we're 30 now. 
Hi, look, so I'm not Annabelle, I'm Michelle Washington. I'm just Hi, using a friend's computer. How are you? Um, thanks for taking the time tonight. Look, um, I get really concerned when I um, hear people talk about um, congestion on roads like Balgala Road. Um, a lot of those journeys that are being made by car are local journeys that can be made on foot or by bike. But we And we need to focus, I think, on improving the conditions, the safety and the attractiveness. We need to make it quicker to get to the pool and the gym um, by bike and walking than by getting in the car. And there are a whole lot of interventions that can make that whole Balgala area much easier and safer. The peak periods in that section of road are for school drop-off um, and Saturday sport. Um, kids who are going to sport can get on their bikes with their parents and do that. And so I think you also need to remember that the solutions for road congestion, if you go along with a transport engineer's approach sometimes, is to make places look like what has happened around the Northern Beaches Hospital Junction. If you look at all those streets, the town centres, um, around there they have become like places on motorways and you know I live right near Balgala Road and I, I don't want Balgala Road to become um, a four-lane road I, I don't want you know a series of series of traffic lights where pedestrians have to wait forever to cross the road so I just flag on behalf of people who live in that area all the neighbours that I speak to and I've been door knocking and standing on my corner and talking to people, they want to be able to walk to the dog park, they want to be able to walk to the, the, the um, child childcare centres and we have three of them, they want their kids to be able to walk to school and it's all age groups, it's not just school kids, it's older people, it's people with animals and dogs. So I just put my hand up to say, please, we don't want to solve That's traffic congestion in the way that they've done it around the Northern Beaches Hospital. It's a residential area, it's a community area, it's not a freeway. And if the Northern Beaches Tunnel brings these kind of conditions, then I think residents would think very differently about the tunnel. If and anything, Michelle, we've got to protect ourselves. So like, don't let any more traffic come in is my view. And Michelle, you had some really practical ideas when we spoke about how we can do some of those. I don't know if you want to share some of those ideas with the Team. Yeah. Oh, well, look, I was really um, keen to ask um, Piper the question. One of the things that I think would be really, really interesting, and I actually spoke with some colleagues who um, work for Transport for New South Wales today, who are looking um, at the transport strategy up updates. And I think one of the really important target um, groups that we don't always talk to about transport are youth. So 12 to 24, I think, is the definition of of youth, but you know that either side of that's fine as well. But we really need to ask them where do they want to go, where are they going, how do they get there, um, and and how would they like to get there? And actually, a lot of young people that I've spoken to don't necessarily want to get their their driver's license, or if they do, they definitely don't want to have to pay and maintain a car. You know, as a parent of an older teenager you know, I'm not going to buy her a car and it will be a long time before she'll be able to afford to buy a car. She won't want to drive to university. She'll want to get public transport is, you know, I think will be her view. Um, you know, are electric bikes attractive options? Um, they're probably more efficient than school buses at the moment. Um, so, you know, I think we need to ask young people, how do you want to move around? And it's not just for school, it's how do you get to jobs? How do you get to the library? How do you get to sport? And then later on university um, to the ferry and that sort of thing. So that's just one idea. I think it'd be really great to work um, with the school communities. Um, I'm a member of the PNC and it's one of the things that I'm going to be putting forward to the the um, collective group of PNCs um, on the northern beaches that we, we we work with council and transport for New South Wales on that youth travel planning and action plan. Um, I'm absolutely passionate about electric bikes. I think for the northern beaches, you know, we should be manufacturing them here. We should be designing them. You know, of anywhere in Sydney, this is the perfect spot for electric bikes. So before we start talking about um, increasing road capacity or about building more car parking, um, you know, give people a discount. You know, I don't want two car parking permits, but maybe you give me a bonus if um, to, to spend in a local bike shop to buy an electric bike for my family instead of the car parking 
um, voucher. So let's let's be really creative, but really understand what the community wants. Council's done some brilliant work on understanding what the community want, and you guys will be able to tell me the number, but I thought there was a massive um, interest in reducing car dependency. Is the number, I can't remember, is it, they want to reduce it by 38% or I can't remember the magic number. I, I, I voted for Michelle for council. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't worry, I'll, I'll just be in the background giving some ideas. But yeah, look, I think there's a lot of really practical things. Like before, you know, just what do people want? We don't want to yeah. live on motorways. We don't want to have to, you know, roundabouts are the worst thing for pedestrian and cyclists. They set everything backwards. Um, yeah. One way systems are a nightmare because cars just go faster. Reduce the speed to 30 make it hard for people to go fast and then you'll get safe walkable environments. Yep. No. Agreed and, and watch this space because um, that's exactly the kind of stuff we are trying to roll out. We've, we've trialled and errored in some places but by and large it's been very positive and um, the 30k thing has been very well received. Yep. Um, yep. Certainly in DY they're asking for 40 to 30 now so that's really interesting um, and the, the, the shared paths we've been putting through, like through Queenscliff, Freshy, et cetera, have been well received and are being well used. Um, but you now need that end of trip stuff as well, to your point about giving um, free passes, for example. Well, give me a free swipe card to be able to put my electric bike into a safe um, <laughs> thing at the beach or in the town centre. So, yeah, couldn't agree more. And um, Piper doesn't like to walk, she runs. And that's where <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> No, but there's some great ideas there. And um, you're right, like I catch public transport to uni. Um, I have to drive quite a bit for training, but I hate having to pay for the petrol. It's very expensive. And you're right, young people just don't really have the funds to be able to drive everywhere um, and do that all the time. So it is really important to create um, more ways for yeah people to get places, um, especially locally. If Yeah, if it's just to the gym locally or it's to um, go to the local park or whatever um, I think yeah that will really help if there's better options there. I think um, it's worth noting sorry just to comment on that too the more people that we encourage to walk and cycle then that makes room on the roads for essential users who really need to use their car and and we have to acknowledge there are always people that you know working nasty shifts or um have, have less less mobility and that sort of thing but you know it's it's good for everybody to get cars yeah. off the road including drivers absolutely yeah uh, i'm just conscious we are running out of time i know liam has a quick question um can you please tell us a bit more about plans and ideas on affordable housing? Um, so, Michael, did you want to comment on that quickly and then we'll have to yeah. wrap it up? Um, yeah, no worries. Very quickly, um, from a personal point of view, that's something that I, I think that the councils I've been in charge of has failed to do um, properly. Um, we've tried and failed. So um, gov the market hasn't worked in terms of what the state and federal want to do. So that, that market approach has failed everybody and it's made things worse. So I think council has to be a bit more proactive now. So for me personally, I'd like to see this council um, tackle it in a different way. And um, that might be using our own. We've adopted an affordable housing policy. Well, that's great to Brian's early point, lots of plans, lots of policies. So, but we've actually got our first, I think, million, million and a half dollars, one and a half million from one developer to bring to affordable housing, um, which is which is a good start. We've got 15% slated for within the actual. Um, Frentice Forest precincts, which is good. So there should be two to 300 units around the um, Frentice Forest Hospital over the next five years come on the market for affordable housing um, managed by a third party provider. But other things that council can do um, is like, we keep advocating for the state government to use their land and, and see the social value, not the dollar value of the land and has far more greater dollar value in the long and long medium term. So. Um, that's one thing, um, but separately, we've got some of our own land that I think we should be looking to pass to a third party and develop um, a proper third party social housing and also make it easy for um, some, someone like a, a bridge housing who now manages the public housing. Um, I, I told this story yesterday at the uh, well, Friday at the housing forum that the state government boasted that in Narrowena they sold a property a few years ago for. $1.2 million and bought two $600,000 townhouses at Blacktown. Well, that's great. Now I don't have a 
public housing tenant here who's probably got a job locally and got friends and locally they've been shipped out. So why don't we keep that person there, subdivide the land into two additional lots so you can have a social housing and a private housing. So you've got the private, social and public all in the one block of land. It's that medium density, that missing middle, which makes keeps it affordable and it provides housing opportunities for the youth um, for those who are missing out as well in, in that sort of missing middle, there's a demand for it and we just have to be more proactive about it, and particularly seeing how we can use our land better. Yeah. yeah, I think it is a really important issue. I know I don't want to move away from the northern beaches, but if I want to move out of home, it will be pretty hard to afford to live somewhere um, near where I currently am. So I'll be with mum and dad for a bit longer, I think. I'm sure um, I'll love it. <laughs> Um, we've actually run out of time, unfortunately. Um, it was great to hear some of your ideas tonight. Um, and if you have other concerns or um, yeah, issues you want to discuss, feel free to contact us. Um, but before you leave tonight, I do want to give you a quick outline as to how democracy works in our local area. So on the 4th of December, you will need to vote at the local council election for three Manly Ward councillors. The Northern Beaches Council has five wards, Pittwater, Narrabeen, French's Forest, Curl Curl, and the Amazing Manly, which includes Manly, Fairlight, Seaforth, Balgala, North Balgala, Balgala Heights, Clontarf, Manly Vale, and the south side of Queenscliff. Um, so three councillors are elected in each ward from the different groups or parties who stand for election. So all three of us, um, Chris, Sarah and myself, are ready to represent you and we'll take your concerns and advocate for you in council. So on the 4th of December, we'd encourage you to look for the Your Northern Beaches Independent team on the ballot paper and vote one above the line for Your Northern Beaches Independent team. Um, however, next Monday, 22nd of November, the pre-poll pre process will start. So you'll be able to attend um, St Matthews Manly or Warringah Mall Community Room or there's actually five other places in the Northern Beaches and cast your vote. Um, but hopefully we can meet you in person soon. Look out for the orange shirts and caps or email us to continue the chat um, and we'll see you at pre-poll or on election day um, at an election booth. So that concludes tonight's town hall session. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your care for our great community this evening. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for hosting, Piper. Thanks, everyone, for your interaction. Excellent. And all Enjoy the ideas, it. I think that's been really, really interesting. So uh, good yeah. to hear from you all.